Hi, my name is Jeff Sackman. I run a GMAT prep website called GMAT Hacks, and there you can find more information about my comprehensive book about all GMAT math content called Total GMAT Math. What I want to talk to you about today is one of the topics in Total GMAT Math, absolute value. This is probably something that you were exposed to at some point in your school days, maybe in an early pre-algebra or algebra class, and maybe you remember the basics, but as with most topics on the GMAT, the test will examine your abilities to work with it in ways that you might not be familiar with. So I want to give you a brief refresher course on absolute value and show you some things that you might not already be familiar with. So first, some basic definitions. What is absolute value? Absolute value is always going to spit out a positive number. So let's say we do the absolute value of 7. Those two straight lines indicate the absolute value of what's inside. So the absolute value of 7 is 7. We're just taking it. If it's positive, we leave it the way it is. If it's negative, absolute value of minus 7, we're just turning it into the positive version of itself. Technically, what we're doing there is if what's inside is negative, we're taking it and multiplying it by minus 1. So minus 7 times minus 1 equals 7. So in a nutshell, absolute value means one of two things. If what's inside is positive, we leave it alone. If what's inside is negative, we multiply by minus 1. So it's all dependent on what's inside the absolute value signs, and there's one of two things that we could end up doing to it. So, before we go and look at a further example and how it gets more complicated when there are variables involved, a lot of students wonder, why absolute value? What's the point here? What are we really getting at mathematically? What's going on is really just a way of representing differences or distances. Think of two points on a number line. So we have two and we have eight. You don't need to do any math to do this, but the distance between two and eight is six, right? We know that. One way of getting there would be eight minus two. Eight minus two equals six. Great, that's our distance. But let's say that you're working with some more complicated equations you're going to come up with the two endpoints and then subtract one from the other. So as part of this process, the end result is 2 minus 8, which gives you minus 6. You're still looking for a distance, the distance between point A and point B. And because in the real world, distance is never negative, we never say negative 6 miles, negative 6 inches, because distance is always positive, differences are always positive, absolute value is just our way of saying we only care about positive numbers here. The end result can't be negative. So it's a final step to give us something that makes sense. Some of the practice problems you'll see working with absolute value and variables, they might have no tie to this realistic example of differences and distances, but ultimately this is part of the reason that it serves a function in math. So that might help you feel that absolute value is more meaningful. It has a more direct application to something realistic. So let's move on to how you can work with absolute value in the context of algebra. So a simple example would just be to say x equals absolute value of minus 6. We know how to find the absolute value of minus 6 because minus 6 is negative. We multiply it by minus 1 and we get 6. x equals 6. All well and good. This is of course a very simple example, but no matter how complicated what's in here is, we just solve it, we'd square something, we'd take the square root, we would multiply by 3, we'd do some subtraction, whatever the steps are, it's just like any other arithmetic. We'd solve what's in here, and then at the end, we'd evaluate it with the absolute value signs. Where it gets trickier is when the variable is within the absolute value signs. So let's say, for instance, 5 equals the absolute value of x. Our way of solving something with absolute value signs depends on knowing what's inside, but we don't currently know anything about x. If x is positive, we don't change it. If x is negative, we do change it. Since we don't know about, about x right now, we need to take a broader view and look at a couple different options. So really, we're going we're gonna to separate all the values of x into two possibilities. First, let's say if x is 
greater than or equal to zero. So it could be zero, three, seven, 16, whatever. If x is greater or equal than zero, then x is not negative. We're not doing anything to it. So the absolute value signs are redundant. If x is seven, absolute value of seven is just seven, no changes. So in that case, five equals x or x equals five. However, if x is less than zero, x is negative, and what we're doing is where those absolute value signs mean multiply the negative by minus one. So for all the cases where x is negative, we have to multiply x by minus one. So five equals x times minus one, or five equals negative x, or multiplying both sides by minus one, x equals minus five. So altogether, what that means is that we don't exactly know what the value of x is. If x is positive, we know it's five. If x is negative, we know it's negative five. But without more information, we don't know the exact value of x. As you might imagine, this is something that the GMAT likes to put on data sufficiency. Statement one might give us something like this. So in that case, statement one is insufficient. We don't know whether x is five or minus five. But statement two might come along and say, x is greater than two. If x is greater than two, and we know it's five or minus five, we can put those two statements together and we know the value of x, but only because we have that additional information. So that's your overview of how to deal with variables inside absolute value signs. And again, what's inside the absolute value signs, everything can be treated the same way. Let's say we have something more complicated, like 10 equals the absolute value of x minus y plus two. I hope you never have to deal with that on test day, but it's a good example of how complicated things could get. So remember when we dealt with this problem, all we did is we said, if x is positive, then this. If x is negative, then this. The difference in this example, x minus y plus two, that's a two, not a z. The difference is we're dealing with this entire unit. The entire unit has to be positive or negative. So in this case, if x minus y plus two is greater than or equal to zero, then 10 equals x minus y plus two. So if the whole thing is positive or zero, we just don't change it. We just take away the absolute value signs. But if x minus y plus two is less than zero, then 10 equals minus one times x minus y plus two. So we have those two scenarios. No matter how complex what's inside the absolute value signs gets, we can apply the same techniques. So in all these cases, when you have a variable inside the absolute value signs, you're generating two possibilities. One, when what's inside is positive or zero, and one, when what's inside is negative. You have to solve both, and you have to consider both, unless, as I mentioned in the data sufficiency example before, unless you have information that says x minus y plus two is in fact positive. So as you can see, this gets tricky, but the underlying concepts are pretty simple. Just taking the absolute value, turning it into two possibilities. For more practice, for more background on this stuff, check out my website, gmathacks.com. Check out my book, Total GMAT Math. See you next time.